Last year, we did something called Pray and Go, where we went throughout the neighborhoods around the church, and we put out these door hangers. Now, I say the areas around the church, the neighborhoods east, north, south, and west of the church. And there were some outer lying areas, too, that were reached by people who lived further away from the church than just in our surrounding area. I wanted to do the same thing again this year. And I think it's, I think it's a blessing when we can hear a testimony from a family who came to First Christian Church of Clemens by God's providential hand. Um, and I am sure that there are many of you here, here this morning in this room who have the same feeling. You maybe, weren't not, you maybe were not reached by the pray and go, but you felt the love and the commitment and the family atmosphere that was handed down by those members that were already a part of First Christian Church of Clemens. I call this congregation a forever family for a particular reason, a few particular reasons. I want us to love one another as Christ has loved us. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. What that means is this. I know that I have an intrinsic value with God. I am dearly loved by my creator, by my maker. And I want others to know that very same thing as well. And I think we do a great job here at FCC of, of displaying that. We do. The second fold to that is this. You're going to have to love each other in eternity, so you better get used to it. All right? That was a joke. Come on, you got to laugh a little bit this morning. Come on now. But as we start this pray and go for this year, I look back on this morning and I kind of wished I had named the sermon Step Up and Step Out because I think it's much better than what I have this morning just simply pray and go for week one. But I want to hit you this morning and many of you that know me knew, know that I do a lot of research and on church growth and things of that nature and what's happening around uh, not only uh, our part of the community, but our state, our part of the country, and church and church growth and those sorts of things, it fascinates me um, to know what's happening in churches today. What can we do different? What can we do better? Well, one thing we will not do different, we will never stop preaching the gospel from God's holy word. All scriptures God breathed, and we're going to learn about that very thing here in just a moment. The moment that a church takes a Bible out of its church is the day it stops being a church. And if that happens after I'm dead and breathing, then shame on you. Um, but that Bible's going to be in, in this church. It's his holy word. But I just want to hit you with a few things that happened or have happened over this last year just to kind of give you a precursor to where I think our church can stand to grow this year. There's a few things that you're going to hear this morning, and one of those things being revival. What does revival mean? Well, it can mean a few different things to a few different people. I believe that you can have a biblical revival. I believe that you can have a church revival. I believe that you can have a spiritual revival. Okay? And we're going to talk about all of those things this morning. In order to do that, I want us to look back to February 8th of this year. Now, many of you may not be aware of this, some of you may, but I believe something very special happened at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky at the first of this year. It really did. Students along with faculty, administrators, and local community leaders and members, even visitors, gathered at Asbury University brought themselves in from out of town to Hughes Auditorium. It was, a it was a spiritual renewal in many regards. Some believed it was a spiritual revival or even maybe a spiritual awakening. I believe it is a multifaceted thing that took place, including all of those things as I just mentioned. What do I believe, you may ask? Well, to be honest, what I believe personally happened at Asbury University 
does not particularly matter. My opinion is not the point this morning, but what God thinks happened is what matters. I'll tell you this. I think it was something godly. I truly do believe it was something godly. And it took place in, it continued to take place in Hughes Auditorium the days following its first gathering. Now, whether it was a revival or not is up to you to decide. But what I believe is this. Listen to me very carefully. I believe what happened at Hughes Auditorium at Asbury University beginning on February 8th and carrying into the next 30 to 45 days was this. The hope of God. The hope of God. Hope in our world and hope for a future in this world. With God in the midst of it all. I believe more than ever the landscape of our world has utterly changed for the community of the church. Just a few short years ago, businesses and churches alike were shut down. And I don't even want to go back to those days. I don't ever want to revisit those days again because it was upsetting. It was unnerving. It was disturbing to me. But they were shut down because of a pandemic. Now, I'm here this morning not to discuss the events of what happened a few short years ago, but I am here to discuss with you this morning the fact that the landscape of our world was forever changed and it was transformed by those actions that took place a few short years ago. Here are some facts. Some 20% of churchgoers stopped attending church at that point. And many of them will never return. Some will, some have. Many will never return. What has become to be known in this realm of this 20% are the cultural Christians. Sarah spoke about this this morning uh, on, on a flatline level to some degree during uh, our Sunday school class. They came to make connections at church, whether for business reasons, to find friends, to socialize, or maybe just to feel like they were a part of something, or maybe that they felt like they needed to belong. And without church happening because of a pandemic shutdown, they lost that avenue and their means of socializing or making connections, and so they just found other avenues to do that. They found other avenues. Something quite astonishing did occur in those days as well. Those who came back to church once things began to reopen, and I'm going to tell you this, full disclosure, we were closed, if I am not mistaken, for two weeks inside. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Ray, the state said six. Well, here's what we did. We met in the parking lot. Nobody said you couldn't meet out in the parking lot. We set up a trailer outside. We set up a PA system outside. We had worship. We had sermons. Everybody could sit in their cars and hear God's word. And I believe that was intentional for God to allow us to do that very thing. And then our PA system blew up after four weeks. And we said, hey, let's just go back inside and leave the doors open. The worst thing they could do is tell us no. Nobody ever said a word, praise the Lord, and we didn't get sick. Praise God. Praise God. But here's what happened in the days after things began to open back up. Those who came to church after the shutdown were hungrier for God's word than ever before. They wanted to know where to find things in Scripture. They wanted to learn how to study God's Word. They wanted books and materials on, learn, on learning how to rightly divide God's Word in ways like had never been done before. In a sense, that was a spiritual awakening and a spiritual revival just within the confines of this church. And praise God. Praise God. It's not the first time any church or any church setting has seen this very same thing. In the late 1960s and early 70s along the West Coast, there was a revival of sorts 
uh, in, in the western part of our country. It was led by a pastor named Chuck Smith. And, and I have to be honest with you. I've looked back at a lot of his notes, and I use some of his material from time to time, and he has a lot of good things to say about God's Word. He's a good theologian. That doesn't mean I agree with everything he has to say, but he's a good theologian. But in the days, in the 1960s and 70s in Chuck Smith's church, something began to happen. Teenagers began to come in, young adults. They described themselves as ones who were looking for truth. Ones looking for truth. Maybe you're here this morning looking for truth. Well, you've come to the right place. It's where God's truth, the one only inerrant truth, His Word can be found. It's in His house and in His good book. Now, unfortunately, just as so often, there were times when maybe these youths or young adults were not accepted. Maybe they were misunderstood in the beginning. And what started off to some would seem like delinquents taking over a church became a revival. The house, God's house, was filled. And people began to learn and understand the great ways of God from men like Chuck Smith and a young man who was involved in this church at the time, Greg Laurie. How fascinating. You see how God calls people into ministry to accomplish great things? A revival. Now, in the early 60s and 70s, this was called the Jesus Culture Movement. I'm not saying I agree with that completely, but I have to tell you, if it's a Jesus movement, I'm all in. If it's revival, if it's spiritual awakening, I'm all in. Family, I believe we, as First Christian Church of Clemens, as God's church, today, we have a greater opportunity than ever before to reach a broken and hurting world. We have an opportunity in a greater way to reach out to those who don't know God's gospel truth. Now, any of you that know me to any degree knows a few things about me. I have an evangelistic heart. I want people to know who Jesus is. And some people, I have to be honest with you, have called me an equal opportunity offender because I want to tell them about who Jesus is. If they don't want to hear it, then I go about my way, but I continue to pray for them. And I have a disciple's heart. I want to not only see people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but I want them to grow. I want them to learn how to follow the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Savior of their life, and learn to walk in His ways and within His will for their life. That's a disciple. No greater act on this earth to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And there are a few things that go along with being a disciple of Jesus Christ. But I believe in this world today we have a greater opportunity than ever before to reach a broken and hurting world. But we've got to reach them with God's truth. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, and training a man into action, correction, and reproof, training him into righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Every good work. Not some, but every. You know what the Apostle Paul is saying here? Timothy those things you learned as a child, I want them to remain with you until the day you take your last breath. God doesn't change his thoughts, and neither should you. Keep his precepts and principles for your life, Timothy. This is what's going to fulfill God's promise within your heart and fulfill God's promise within your life. And it's the fact that you're letting the Holy Spirit speak through you and work through you and leading people into His truth. And you can't lead people into His truth without presenting that gospel truth to them. 
Family, the words of God should lead us to have a desire to tell others what God has done in your life. You heard that from Corey this morning about how a body, a forever family, has forever changed him. God inspired men to write things like 2 Timothy 3.16. God can most certainly inspire you to speak about his word. Can you agree to that? Can I get an amen? Amen. And you can learn to do that by staying in his word. There is no other book like the Bible that has continuity and consistency. Honesty has been circulated more, has survived longer, or has an influence and the power to change a life like God's holy word. Those are the facts. So what am I asking you this morning? Stay in God's word. Learn how to rightly divide his word. Gain an understanding of his word. And then go and tell. Go and tell. Not just at your church, but in your communities, around your home, your neighborhoods, family, friends, jobs, and so on. In order to accomplish this, we must never forget what the Lord has done for us. Never forget. There's great days ahead. There's great days ahead for God's church. I believe that with all of my heart just because of the things that we're going to continue to talk about this morning. The things that we've already talked about. But we must be obedient to the call that is placed upon our life to carry out the great commission. And we're going to talk about that as well. As I mentioned, the landscape of our world has changed and so many things are different. But we must learn to step out in faith and proclaim the promises that God has promised us to a broken world. We must encourage them that there is a promised land full of hope because it is very true. And this morning, I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. If you have your Bibles or you can look on the screen with me, I want to give you the greatest example of the promised land. It's when the Israelites have left Egypt. And God has given them all of these things that he is going to do for them and with them if they will just obey. If my people who are calling upon my name will do thus and so. So, if you have your Bibles or you can look on the screen, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. The whole commandment that I have commanded you today shall be careful to do. You should be careful to do. That you may live and multiply and go and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God had led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commands or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. Jesus quoted some of these verses at one point. He quoted these verses back to Satan when the devil tempted him to turn the stones into bread. Why did he do that? He wanted to remind Satan of a few things. Number one, God is in control. And it's the Lord, God Almighty, Yahweh, who gives commands to do thus and so. 
But he's also making it clear that if those who call upon my name will do thus and so, I will bless them. God called Israel to complete obedience. He's called us to complete obedience as well. Obedience is based on remembering what the Lord has done for you. And he had called the people of Israel as they're wandering through the wilderness to remember the same thing. What have I done for you in the wilderness? Have you not been in the wilderness? Have you never been in the wilderness? Well, you're asking, Pastor Ray, what do you mean? Have you never been through a trial in your life? Have you never had a hardship? Maybe some of you are going through a hardship right now. Well, if you tell me, no, I've never been through a hardship, can I give you a spoiler alert? Be patient. There's one coming. There's one coming. And you better learn how to deal with it now. And the only way to deal with it and deal with it properly, and many of you who are in this room right now can testify to this. I got through that trial in my life because of God Almighty. Can I get an amen? But we must learn to be patient and we must learn to be prepared. And being prepared means walking in the obedient will of God. What will you have me do, O Heavenly Father? You see, here's the thing. When we can't walk, we might can crawl. But when we can't crawl, it's the Lord who will carry you. And so walking in his obedient will will teach you how to ask, Lord, carry me. I can't even crawl. There's a few things for us to recognize here as well. Those trials in this life, as I mentioned, brought you closer to your creator. They brought you closer to him because those trials humbled you. You realized that you needed dependence on something other than yourself. You're powerless. Without God Almighty, without Jesus Christ in your life, you are, in fact, actually bankrupt. And so God humbled Israel just like he has humbled you in times of trial. He brought them to a place where they must learn how to depend on him. Have you been brought to that place? I trust that you have. They had nothing else and no one else to count on except God Almighty. There was nothing left. And that's when we find hope. I have to be honest with you. In our world today, it's real hard to see hope. You can see little snippets of it here and yonder and there and behind you. But it's hard sometimes to see hope in front of you. Unless you're looking toward the promises that God has for you in eternity with him. And here is the facts, dear family. Do we or do we not want heaven to be completely running over abundantly with souls? Then it's up to us to go out and tell. It's in these times when we're humbled that we look to no other way but God's way. We seek his way and not our own. This is what the Hebrew children were beginning to realize after 40 years of going around the same set of mountains time and time again. They were in the wilderness. Insanity. Back and forth. But how many times in our lives have we gone back and forth as well in insanity and realized that Lord, if I had just trusted you the first time, if I had just reached out to you in prayer and cried out to you in my troubles, that you would have snapped my chains in the very beginning. Sometimes we're stubborn people and we refuse to re receive the truth that God has a plan of protection that he's already granted to us. So we got to do is accept it. Far too often we get to thank God just for having heat in our homes when it's cold, or air when it's warm. We forget to thank God for the roof over our head, the food on our table, or the car that gets up and cranks every morning, even though it shouldn't. Built by man, we take so much for granted. The Israelites took God's hand for granted, his provision for granted those 40 years. And listen to me, family. If we are a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, then we cannot take for granted what God is willing to do, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those whom we love and we care about. And they deserve to know what God can do for them. 
A real life committed to God is a life without hesitation, who is uninhibited, who is not fearful, and not afraid to tell others what God has done for them. It should be a deep longing within our hearts to tell others of God's saving grace that we serve a mighty God who was willing to bless and provide if we will do thus and so. An entire generation of arrogant, self-willed, die-hearted, stubborn people had to pass on. They had to die in the wilderness before the children of Israel were allowed to go into the promised land. <clears throat> Family, I got to be honest with you. I believe our world is kind of stagnant for God. I believe our world, in a lot of ways, doesn't want to hear about God. They may even be angry about God. But that should be of no consequence to you. Sometimes people, people can be arrogant, self-willed, stubborn, and stiff-necked. But if they hear about what Jesus Christ can do for them and how he can change their life, then they will be forever changed. There's lots of ways you can approach people. Entering the promised land for the Israelites gave a new opportunity to them. I want you to consider something for a minute. The promised land was already inhabited. It was the land of Canaan. There were people living there. It was a mission field, people. They had an opportunity to go into a new land and tell them about their great God, the God of the Hebrews. They were a builder generation, and they were allowed to go into a land flowing with milk and honey. What about you? Are you living in the promised land? Oh, I think you are. I trust you're not taking it for granted. I believe we live in a country that's utterly blessed even at this point, even with so many things going wrong. I believe in this country, with the problems that we see around us, we can still be a builder generation. This is a mission field, family. America is a mission field. Clemens is a mission field. Forsyth County, Winston-Salem, Greensboro, the state of North Carolina, the southern part of the United States is a mission field. And we have an opportunity like no other before to be a builder generation for the gospel and the kingdom of heaven for eternity. And to save souls through God's saving grace. I want you to hear me. Again, I'm a stats guy. I like facts. In the past few years, the stats read like this. Baby boomers claim to be about a third Christian. Generation X or about a fourth Christian. Up till this last year, millennials claimed to be about 15%. This year, new research shows that the last numbers are on the increase. Now, those numbers stand at 19 to 20 percent. That adds fuel to the fire. Well, you say, Pastor Ray, well, that's only 4 percent. 15 percent, that's 4 to 5, maybe 6 percent, up to 20. Well, guess what? Praise the Lord, the number went up. Amen. Gen Z is the most willing to hear God's gospel truth than any of the last four to five generations. Can I get an amen? So what do you do? Do you rest on your laws? Do you sit down in a pew and you sit on your hands and you not say a word? Do you put your finger over your mouth and learn how to remain silent? Heavens, no. You go and tell. You go and tell. Now, a <clears throat> little side note. Baby boomers were born in the years 1946 to 1964. Gen X, 65 to 1980. I'm not going to tell you which one of those I fall in, but it's close to both. I'm getting old. 
Some of you are older than me. Roby. But I'm not going to tell you where I fall. Millennials. 82 to 94. Now, these are the years. Not how old they are, the years, people. Gen Z, 1994 to 2010. Hey, some of you sitting in this room have children that are that age. Some of you sitting in this room have grandchildren that age. And I'm going to go one step further. Some of you have great-grandchildren that go that age. What's more important? Eternity in heaven are making them happy. Can I tell you something? Eternity in heaven is what's important. We must have a hunger and a thirst today for God's truth like no other. Because I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be real honest with you. Jesus is closer to coming today than he was yesterday. You hear me? And tomorrow, he'll be closer then than he was today. Well, you say, Pastor Ray, there's all sorts of things that need to happen before Jesus comes back. You don't think that God can't snap his hands and say, I'm done with this. Go back and get my children. And he can do it in the twinkling of an eye just like he said he would. Well, Pastor Ray, the temple has to be rebuilt. Well, you think God can't put that temple back up in a moment's notice? You think he can't do that in a flash and a twinkling of an eye as well? Those things are up to God. You trust God and you walk within his obedient will. And in the meantime, you go and tell. You proclaim that gospel truth. God made a covenant with his people. And it gave them It gave them proof of who he was. It gave them a hunger for who he was and what he could do. He promised to feed them. Not only with manna, but the living word. Jesus Christ. And a hunger should spring forth for us and in us to spread the gospel to a world, to a wilderness, to a promised land like we've never had before. A world that can be led into the promised land by God's truth. Let me give you another fact-finding mission. I love to study theology. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy literally means second law restated second law restated in this book of Deuteronomy God does this he makes a bilateral covenant with the children of Israel with the Hebrews if my people do this if my people do this then I will do this. In other words, listen to me, family. I love you so much that if you follow my commands, I will bless you. He's not going to give you a new Cadillac, but he will feed you with manna from heaven. Even what men didn't understand. He will keep your feet from swelling. And he will give you the living water, the living word. So, I have a challenge for you. I think it's time. I think it's beyond time. I think it's past time to be ready to show people where that promised land is. And it's in God's house. It's within God's truth. It's within God's holy word. The Bible.